Hey everyone, welcome back to another Ask GN episode. As always, leave your questions in the comment section below. And we also have a Patreon version of this, so it's a shorter bonus episode on patreon.com slash gamersnexus, where we'll post that if you want to get access to that one, or post in our Discord where I can see your questions there too. So for this week, we have a few ones about cooling, about overclocking headroom, where does money go for high-end motherboards? So we'll talk about that. Before that, this video is brought to you by our limited edition foil anniversary shirt. This shirt commemorates our 10 year anniversary design and is available in foil on a high quality cotton shirt, completely custom designed for GN. We're making a limited amount of these and then we'll never make them again. So get your pre-order in now to ensure you get yours. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to grab the GN foil teardown anniversary shirt now. Just before getting into the first question, as you saw, hopefully, in probably the ad before this section, this is our new shirt. It's a limited edition shirt. It's kind of meta because it's it's an, a one year anniversary of a 10 year anniversary shirt design. So we're making a limited amount of these. Once they're sold, that's it. They're gone. We're not making more. If you want to get one, you can pre-order yours on store.gamersnexus.net. We're taking pre-orders just to figure out the size distribution so that we can order the right amount of each size. Uh, and then it'll be a limited quantity once we figure that out. So grab it there if you want to pick it up. It is a silver foil print basically and looks pretty damn cool and also shiny for the teardown logo design. First question is from Space Jam Flam who says, why the sweet shit are Cooler Master AIOs so cheap? What's the catch? The catch is that they are not good. So I several months ago tried to review one of these because of the reason you're asking they're cheap and the problem we had was it leaked and uh, i think that's a pretty common problem so our leak was because there are there's like zero protection between where the screw for the fan goes in and a pipe in the radiator typically a clc is designed in a way that it's either got a metal plate behind the screw so if a screw is too long it will hit the plate and no damage is caused, or the fins are behind the screw. And if you bend fins, it's really completely irrelevant. It's not gonna matter at the end of the day. If you drive a screw in there though, and it hits a water line, that's a problem. So what happened here, I used the screws that Cooler Master included, but the tolerance between them was pretty large. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was like nearly a millimeter or something. And one of them was long enough to hit a water line and cause a rupture and leak all the fluid out. So we never reviewed it. Uh, and uh, fortunately was able to save the test bench because it wasn't on. But it's just a design flaw, you can work around it. Hopefully they've fixed the problem by now, it's been months. So I would hope that the screws are tighter tolerances or just shorter rather than longer when there is a tolerance issue. So maybe that problem's fixed. Cooling wise, they're also not impressive. I don't know, if there's enough interest, maybe I'll buy another one and, and kind of demonstrate it. But there's a reason they're cheap, and uh, that's part of it, the leakage problem. The other one being performance is really not that great. Like you're better off buying a decent air cooler for the same price than a low-end liquid cooler in a lot of instances. Because low-end liquid coolers, the points of failure, the extra point of failure is exaggerated just because like if you're spending $60 on low-end liquid versus high-end air, high-end air, that fan might die in like 17 years. But the pump, who knows what kind of problems you're gonna have with that, including pump wine. Next question is from Frantic Killer, who says, how much additional overclock headroom can we expect from a full monoblock covering both the CPU and VRMs? Is it even worth it? Hopefully you can do thermal testing for comparison. Uh, I'll send you a monoblock if you need it. Also, thanks for the great content. So when it comes to overclocking, we did a, a pretty good content piece that answers this on the ASUS Rampage 6 Extreme. And the problem with that board was the VRM had absolutely no way to dissipate all the heat that it was creating from a higher overclock, especially with an 18 core CPU or a 14 core CPU or something like that. So when you're talking about VRMs, really the, the limiting factor is, is it thermal throttling? Is it hitting a point where protections are kicking in? If it's not, then really, as long as the CPU is reasonably cool and the VRM is within spec, there's not gonna be a huge difference in performance. Keeping the VRM colder to a point of say like 50 degrees Celsius as opposed to 90, it's not really gonna matter at the end of the day. Keeping it colder at say 90 or 70 or whatever versus 140, that matters because you might be tripping 
over thermal protect or uh, over temperature protection at that point, OTP or uh, some other issues. Uh, high current applications will strain VRMs that don't have a good cooling system on them already. So the new motherboards for X399 are looking a bit better. Some of the X470 boards, like that Gigabyte one, have proper finned heat sinks. Those do really well and don't even need the performance. EVGA X299 Dark has fans on it. One of the, the Asus Zenith board has a fan on the VRM. So you don't really need a monoblock uh, in most cases, just a fan will suffice. But for purposes of fitting with your open loop system, you might as well go with it if you feel like it looks better. And uh, if you think it's gonna be easier or quieter than installing more fans near the VRM. That's really the only thing. But keeping a VRM is not like a GPU. If you keep a VRM really cold, it's not going to perform significantly better for your frequency than say like if you keep a GPU at 40 degrees versus 80. That'll make a big difference. But the VRM does not behave the same way. Next, also they can take a hell of a lot of heat. As I said, 150 is a common over temperature protection point and they start derating sort of 125 to 150 range for MOSFETs and for inductors. Capacitors are more limited, but they also tend to not have the same thermal problem. Capacitors, you might have 5,000 hours of life at 105 degrees Celsius or something, uh, but they rarely reach that temperature unless it's really poorly designed. Next question is actually a really interesting one. Static Albatross says, where does money go on high-end motherboards? It seems like high-quality motherboards with good overclocking features tend to have a lot of non-performance extras like M.2 covers, higher-end audio, Wi-Fi, more RGB and all caps, etc. How much do these features end up costing the consumer? The RGB is the one I'm going to focus on, so I, I did have time to talk to some people in the industry who make motherboards and other components. And the answer for RGB, like let's say you have a really high-end overclocking board, by the time you're at the point of putting LEDs on it, it's a couple bucks. So a lot of the time you're talking five, maybe $10 difference in reasonable MSRP impact, unless it's a marketing thing where they can just market up a ton because they're the only vendor who does it or whatever. But that's not the case anymore. So typically it's like five to 10 bucks to add some LEDs. If they're doing something like the digital RGB LEDs, like the MSI Lightning card that we saw at Computex 2017, then it starts costing a lot more because you need a ton of LEDs to get that effect to look good and that costs money. So that costs more with the digital RGB LED light pipes and stuff like that. But if it's just LEDs all over the board, it doesn't cost a whole lot. So fortunately, it doesn't impact consumer price in theory very much. Like the bomb, the bill of material cost is low. Uh, and so unless they're marketing it up like a thousand percent, it shouldn't really impact you a whole lot. Other features, M.2 covers, metal covers, anything that's like shaped or tooled or anything like that, that can cost a lot because tooling costs a lot. Just depends on how they make it, if it's like injection molded, if it's plastic, or if it's if it literally requires a tool in like a, a punch or something like that, some big machinery to make it. Uh, those cost a lot more. But all the stuff, you're talking dollars for the most part. Wi-Fi can cost a lot. So wireless is high single digits for pricing for most of the wireless cards that you see on motherboards these days, low double digits in some instances. Uh, things like certifications to have different vendor, first party vendor logos on the board, I, I won't specify, but those can cost a lot too. So a lot of your money goes towards the VRM for the most part. And then if it's got a lot of metal on it that requires custom stamping or anything like that, like. The VRM heat sinks can cost a lot of money too, just because it's a whole lot of metal. So if they do some complex design with it, that's where some of your money goes. Most of it's the actual VRM though. Next question, quick shot gaming. Would the i5-8600K outperform the 7700K in video editing, six cores, six threads versus four cores, eight threads? We have a video on Adobe Premiere Performance with the 8700K and Threadripper and high-end Intel CPUs. Our findings were that, generally speaking, well, this is specific to Adobe Premiere. With Adobe Premiere, you're better off with a high frequency, lower core count device with an IGP than anything else. And the video quality output is non-existent, if you're uploading to YouTube especially. So people who say, but you rendered on a GPU, it's going to look worse. No, you're wrong. <laughs> For purposes of YouTube, it compresses the hell out of stuff so much that it actually, it's just invisible, the differences. Uh, if you could even tell, it has to be really high bit rate. So that might be correct in some applications, but not our specific application. And for that reason, using a lower end CPU with an IGP 
basically outperforms or performs equally to a lot of the HEDT stuff. 8600K versus 7700K, whichever one clocks higher for Adobe Premiere is going to be better. And then beyond, and it's also negligible at that point, uh, especially because you should be CUDA accelerating anyway. And then beyond that, as long as the application is heavily multi-threaded, then more threads will be better than not. It just kind of depends on the application. Blender, for example, is pretty multi-threaded. Uh, and we have benchmarks on Blender for the 8600K versus the 7700 specifically. If you want to see those results, I don't have them off the top of my head. Next question is from Steamed, who says, ST33Med says, in the future, would it be possible to make the mouse, oh, the mouse pad have black and blue colors? No offense, it looks great, just too bright for a mouse pad for me. So this, we kind of silently posted a new mouse pad design that we have on the store. Haven't, I guess this is the announcement of it, but we'll do something more official later. But uh, we've got a white and blue mouse pad design that we did and tracks very well, looks great. It is white and blue. So if those colors don't work for you, we're considering a black and blue option. But let me know in the comments how interested you are in the one we posted. It's on store.gamersnexus.net if you want to look at it. It's not out yet. That's why I didn't officially announce it or anything. But take a look. If you like it for the unique white and blue design, awesome. You can grab it there. If you want the same design but black and blue, let me know. And then we do have other mouse pad designs coming forward as well. It's just uh, it's a matter of, obviously, it takes time to make all this stuff. But we are trying to make multiple designs to appeal to everyone. Next question, the Phoenix. I noticed that you and no other tech channels are talking about the stock prices and changes for NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, et cetera. Is there a reason of just not the category of your channel? Uh, is OK, so is this for a reason or just not the category of your channel, I think, is what they meant to say. Uh, I am qualified to talk about technology and hardware. I'm not qualified to talk about stock prices and the stock market. The two might have overlap for some people, but we focus on the technology, so we don't talk about stock prices unless... I might mention it like in a news video, but I'm not going to advise for or against purchasing stock because that's not my place in this machine. There are other people who can do that. Next question is from Grim12 who says, would it make sense, in theory at least, ignoring cost and efficiency, to intentionally buy an overkill graphics card for a given performance level to minimize noise and heat output? Sort of. If noise is a big problem, then yes, you spend more to get rid of it. So uh, something like the FTW3 Ultra Silent, it's a fat card. It has a, a really big fin stack on it. And that anything with a, a large radiator or a fin stack will dissipate the heat over a wider surface area. It doesn't require the fans to spin up as early or for uh, as high of an RPM. And that will reduce your noise levels, but you pay more because it's more metal. And obviously, it's the other problem here is when you get into like ultra silence, like neurotic level of silence, the issue is it's a low volume part. So low volume parts cost more to make because they can't make as many of them, so they don't get volume discounts. So it can be worth it. It's just how much do you really care about the noise? Because you can do stuff on your own too, like just get better cooling in your case. This is a, a problem with case design is there's a limit to how much you can stifle silence by just putting plastic walls in front of everything versus designing it with good airflow and running lower RPMs, which can address the same problem. But either way, if you get enough airflow into your case and uh, you custom tune the fan profile on the video card, assuming it's not a garbage cooler, you can get, make up a lot of ground without having to buy the special fancy ultra silent cards. It's just those make it easier if you want something out of the box. They typically have fan profiles that are tuned lower as well, so they don't get the same clock, but they are quieter out of the box. If you can do that tuning on your own, I would advise that you do it as long as you get a baseline card that's not complete garbage, because those exist too, and then you should be fine and save a couple bucks as well. Corwin says, do you make use of a torque driver to standardize mounting pressures during thermal testing? Would there be much advantage of this when it comes to things like core deltas? We do use torque drivers for some stuff. So like, for example, when we did that uh, mounting pressure comparison, I think with the Vega cards where we had a mounting pressure paper that sort of colorizes as it receives force, that's done with a torque driver to make sure that it's the same amount of force in the same spots every time. The, the screw pattern we do is the same too for that specific testing anyway, just to make sure that it's the same, like corner to corner, exact corner screws that we're screwing in at the same time in the same order, uh, same amount of force, all that stuff to standardize it. For coolers, yes, but for the most part with coolers, if you're just tightening to a point where it stops turning 
within reason, that will do pretty much the same thing. But we do have torque drivers. I think there's one on the wall behind me somewhere uh, for when we need those. Last question is from Pyro CF, who says, for the average overclocker, is there much benefit to increasing the CPU current capability past 100%? I've not noticed it increase stability of performance, just, <laughs> just temperatures. I'm guessing at non-extreme OCs, you're not going to be hitting a power limit. We, I don't know, it depends on your board, I guess, but I hit power limits all the time, or current limits all the time, by not changing that setting. So it depends partly on the board and the CPU and how much you're overclocking, but with an 8700K, for example, or with even the Intel NUC we were working on, current limits are pretty easy to hit. So if you're really overclocking, I would advise uncapping the current limit or, or pushing it to a level you feel comfortable with because uh, you will current throttle in scenarios that draw more current. Like, for example, Cinebench does a decent amount of amperage. Uh, Prime95 does a lot. Blender does a good amount. So anything like that where you're pushing more current through an overclock, then the motherboard will allow for you should uncap it but each motherboard is going to have a different ocp or current throttle territory for the cpu each cpu has different tolerances as well for where they sort of cut off the current versus uh versus whatever they think is reasonably set i don't know it depends on the board so some of the boards we work with have a 50 amp hard limit some of them with uh, 8700K is at 4.9 gigahertz I was hitting current limits. So I would recommend uncapping it, generally speaking. Performance is not going to be directly derived from a current limit aside from eliminating a throttle point. That's really the only thing to be concerned about. And that's it for this one. As always, you can post your questions below for the next episodes. We'll probably do two of these for this week. Then we've got the Patreon episode on patreon.com slash gamersnexus. You can also pick up this shirt before it's gone forever at store.gamersnexus.net and support us again, patreon.com. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.